More creepy and scary TikToks coming right at you with the man himself. Jet Ski Chuck. Life is a simulation and a legitimate professor has proved it. James Gates, a theoretical physicist at MIT with two bachelor degrees and a PhD, found literal computer code embedded in the most fundamental building blocks of reality called strings. Now, string theory is a tough one, but I'm gonna break it down for you in a way that an 11 year old would understand. So if you don't get this, hey, go back to grade five, bruh. Right, so we got my boy Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is basically just a theory of everything big planets, gravity, the universe, all the way back to the Big Bang. Then we got the new kid in town, quantum physics. This is the theory of everything small, like particles, atoms, and molecules, where the general laws of physics, like gravity, don't apply anymore. The same is true the other way around. Quantum laws don't apply to regular-sized physics. So we got general relativity, everything big, and quantum physics, everything small, like Yoda. But both of these realms have the same parent, the Big Bang, at which point everything that is now big used to be small. If the small can become big, then quantum and general relativity need some sort of theory that can unify them. That is string theory. What happens to the big when it's small? What happens when you zoom into an atom? You see protons and neutrons in the center with electrons all around it. Now, what about inside a neutron? Even smaller particles called quarks. So how deep does the scale go? Conventional science will tell you there's nothing inside these quarks. But string theory suggests there's a tiny filament or a string of pure energy that exists inside of them. And just like the string of a guitar vibrates and creates different sound based on its shape and tension, the strings in string theory vibrate. But instead of sound, they produce matter in the form of particles. This completely changes the way you look at the world. Every particle in the universe is just a string vibrating at a different frequency. And every vibrational pattern has its own associated particle. So if you break anything down far enough, we're all just energy vibrating at differing wavelengths to form matter. Although it's still just a theory, this would link general relativity to the quantum realm and form what is known as the theory of everything. Okay, yeah, cool. Now where is this computer code found? When Dr. James Gates took a look at a set of equations derived from string theory, he found binary code. Error correcting code used for compressing data on a computer. A sequence of ones and zeros, the same code that is used by popular search engines, which, according to him, who has a PhD in theoretical physics from MIT, doesn't just resemble computer code, it literally is computer code. Meaning, if we break matter and energy down far enough, we eventually find compressing computer code etched into the very fabric of reality. So, who wrote this code? Are we living in, dare I say, a simulation? Life is a simulation. This is strictly for entertainment purposes, of course. You definitely want to do your own research on everything. But um, that was definitely one of the best theories I've ever heard. This is my first time hearing about it. Um, we're definitely going to be diving in deeper on this, gang. Shout out to everyone that's been liking, subscribing. I appreciate you guys. And if you haven't already, go ahead and hit that like button and go ahead and subscribe. You know, I appreciate you guys. We do this every single day. The community is growing. We just reached 3,000. Huge shout out to everyone that's been tapping in, dropping in the videos early. Not Shout out to the notification gang. You know, you guys are the best. You know, but I'm not going to take up too much more of your time. We're going to dive more into this string theory. These Adinko codes look like designs on clothing and patterns. When you turn these Adinko codes look like designs on clothing and patterns. When you turn these designs into three-dimensional structures, they become something called error correcting codes. Mm. And Professor James S. Gates, a black professor who used to be the um, the science advisor for Obama, he turned them into three-dimensional objects, and then from there he found the error correcting codes. He was analyzing and accessing information about the ether of space-time, and he discovered that the entire ether, in other words, everything this soup that we're operating in was throughout the entire universe, is running on a specific code. It's called an Adinko code. It's called error correcting codes. The same exact kind of codes that run search engines. Who is the creator of the simulation? Uh, some people say it's aliens. Uh, there was a professor at Oxford who wrote a paper about this back in 2003 named Nick Bostrom, and he, he thinks it's future versions of ourselves. So he thinks we're in what we'd call wow. an ancestor simulation. Like if we created a game of ancient Rome, they would be like our ancestors in a way. There are others who say it's God or pure consciousness outside of the matrix. So all the religions, not just any specific religion, but pretty much all of them have been telling us that the physical world is not the real world, that there's another world out there beyond this. Uh, and so that's yet another theory of what's outside. Do you believe this is probable, possible? I believe it's probable, like more than a 50% chance. 
uh, that we are inside some type of... Those are pretty high odds. Well, yeah, and, you know, as I studied the different religions, I realized that they were telling us the same thing that modern computer science uh, and that modern physics is starting to tell us uh, about the nature of reality. What if somebody or something shut this game off instantly? What would happen to us? Well, this depends a little bit on what I call the NPC version or the RPG version. So NPC means non-player character. And those are the characters inside the video games that are just AI. You know, the bank teller or the right. bartender or the orcs that you're fighting. And then there's the RPG version or the role-playing game version. Those are the characters that we play. So if you right and now. I were in a game, we would have avatars within the game. And so what happens when you shut down a game if you're playing, like World of Warcraft, or if you had a virtual reality headset on? You take off the headset, and there's still you outside of the game. But the problem is, in something like The Matrix, if you remember, Keanu Reeves and Morpheus and the others, they had those wires that connected into the back of their right. brain. So they forgot that they were inside a video game. They didn't realize it. Now, on the other hand, if we're just non-player characters, if we're just AI within the game and you shut off the game, then those characters go to sleep until you can restart those again. Interesting take. Now, who is the creator of the simulation? That is extremely interesting. Your guys' thoughts below. What if we all were created to be controlled by a specific one person if they allowed us to? How crazy would that be? Anyways, let's go deeper. Guys, your thoughts below. That is wild. It's making the Matrix seem a little bit more real, you know, and I think I heard somewhere that the Terminator in the Matrix was actually connected. So what if this was one giant simulation? My question is, how do you put this on easy mode? I feel like I've been on extreme difficulty lately, but uh, yeah, it's, um, I have a couple questions if this is a simulation. Who are the NPCs? Are animals NPCs? You know, actual agents NPCs? How do we lower the difficulty? Lower the difficulty. And um, yeah, those are my two main questions for right now. As you guys see, we we found the, as you guys see, we found the power stroke sunglasses too. So this cuts throughout. This uh blocks all UV radiation. Let's continue going deeper. A simulation inside of a simulation inside of a simulation or are there actual biological beings that are controlling the simulation that's a great question if you look at the way the universe or the multiverse would be set up it's almost like cells in a human body because you look at the cells in our body it's like a multiverse inside of us and so it's like we're living in a multiverse which which is full of cells each universe could be a cell it could be biological it, it could be that we're in a biological body it could be that we're in a software program i mean there's so many possibilities it's almost endless but i do know that this fundamental basis of what we're living in is light everything you could think of is only a light wave matter of fact due to wave particle duality everything only exists as a wave first and then collapses into what we appear to be the illusion of solid matter later like right now you're here your home exists as a wave of potentials it doesn't even exist as a solid structure now if somebody sees it it collapses instantaneously into a solid structure known as your house and your house has a specific frequency because of the way the atoms were stacked so it always collapses into the same structure everything you can't see exist as waves just like in a video game the next frame only appears when you need it to we're living in that type of a simulation are we a simulation inside of a simulation inside of a simulation well, if you take any object for instance what string theory is sure the basic idea is pretty simple if you take any object for instance the tabletop and magnify it and examine it on very small scales there'll be molecules and atoms and if you look at the atoms and magnify them you'll see that there's a nucleus protons and neutrons surrounded by orbiting electrons. And in 1968, we learned that if you magnify a proton, there's yet further substructure. The Russian dolls continue. Inside, there are three quarks, even smaller particles. Now, for a long time, people thought quarks and electrons were all there was, together with a few other exotic particles that make up the universe. String theory comes along and says, actually, there's one more level of substructure. If you examine an electron or examine a quark, 
an incredibly fine resolution, you'll find that there's a single loop of vibrating energy that we call a string. And that's the idea of string theory, that all of the particles in the universe are different ways in which a fundamental loop of energy can vibrate. Mm -hmm. So much like a violin string can play a C, it can play an A sharp, different notes that our ear senses, different tones, the different ways that these fundamental strings vibrate correspond to the different particles of nature. An electron is like a C, a quark is like an A sharp, and so forth. We, we know that there are these four dimensions. We know that there's height, we know there's width, we know there is length, and we know there's time, right? That's right. There's the four. Right. String theory brings six new dimensions. Yeah, at least six. At least maybe, six. maybe seven. Maybe, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are they? Well, they're actually of a similar character to the ones that we're familiar with. They're just very tiny. And actually, I have a, a small prop that I like oh, to use man, I love to, show to, and tell. <laughs> to, to describe this. Right. So forget about the universe for a moment, and let's just look at this piece of wire. Now, from very far away, this wire would look like it's one-dimensional. In that, for instance, if a little ant was living on it, you'd say, well, it can move left and right along the wire, but that's it. There's only one possibility. Yeah. But then as you get closer to the wire, you realize that there's a second curled up circular dimension, the circular girth of the right. wire. Right. And therefore, our microscopic ant can not only go back and forth, it can also walk around the wire, yeah. a second curled up dimension. And what this little example alerts us to is that dimensions come in two varieties. They can be obvious and long mm -hmm. and easy to see, or they can be tiny and curled up and more difficult to detect, like the circular girth of the wire. Now, what the idea is, according to string theory, is that the fabric of the universe is much like this piece of wire, in that there are the familiar dimensions that you refer to, left, right, back, forth, up and down, and also time, but there can be additional dimensions that are tightly curled up, like the circular girth of the wire, and are so small that we haven't seen them yet because we don't have sufficient magnifying instruments to actually peer down into the nooks and crannies of the spatial fabric and see these extra dimensions. But string theory says that they absolutely have to be there. There are at least six, as you mentioned, and quite possibly seven that are curled up into the fabric of the universe. Is this such a hard idea to tackle that there may be 10 people doing it in the world, or is this something that there is every young physicist on every campus in America thinks that I'm going to find the answer to the riddle of unity in nature. It's more like the latter. These ideas seem abstract at first, but when you do phrase them in the language of mathematics, you find that it's actually not that difficult to describe all these extra dimensions. And graduate students across the country are learning about string theory and doing research, some of it cutting edge research on the theory. How do you go about the investigation? Now, I'm, can I imagine you sitting in front of a computer doing thousands and thousands and thousands of equations? That, that's close to it. Certain projects do require a computer to do the analysis. Other times it's really a pen and paper and it's just manipulating symbols which describe these extra dimensions or which describe the looking strings. Looking for what? Well, what we're looking for is a coherence in the equations which will show us that we actually have a theory that is number one self-consistent and number two actually describes our world. It could be that you come upon a wonderful theory that describes gravity and quantum mechanics and all the things around us, but it misses. It's a near miss. Right. For instance, it might predict that the electron weighs 10 times what it actually does. If that's the case, you have to throw, throw the theory out, out no the good. window. That's right. So what a lot of us are doing is trying to extract observable physics from this theory and compare it with experiment. That's the goal, and we're a bit far from it, but that's what we're trying now, to do. And what a bummer would it be if you think you found it, and it tests well here, it tests well here, it tests well here, it tests well, and then you get to, like your 999th test to see if it fits, it doesn't fit. Yeah, it would be quite a bummer. It would be a real drag, but that's sort of what science is about. You yeah. know, you Trial give it your best arrow. shot. Yeah. yeah. And now where are you in this? The particular work that yeah. I do? What I tend to do is focus upon these extra dimensions. Yeah. And I've been focusing on ways in which they can evolve that Einstein wouldn't have thought possible. It turns out that string theory says that space itself can tear apart and reconnect in a number of complicated ways that Einstein would have thought impossible based upon his pre-string theory understanding of the way the universe evolves. So that's my specialty. Okay, now if I could get together in this room 10 of the smartest physicists in the world, would 9 out of the 10 believe that string theory will explain this one great equation that will explain all of nature? Well if, you let, well, if you let me pick the 10, I could make a 10 out of 10, actually. Well, just say um, 10 really smart ones. I mean, for example, 10 years ago, Stephen Hawking, if right. he was in a room, would not agree. Yeah. You know, are there still people that are not convinced that have the mental 
agility of Stephen Hawking? Sure. There are a few, but it's really becoming a minority group that are the decriers of string theory. In the early 80s, when string theory made a big splash, there were many people who said, this is just a fad. It's just the beginning of something that's going to go away. Right. But we're now in 1999, and 15 years of research and success has shown us that string theory is really part of mainstream theoretical physics. So, yeah, I'd say 90% is a good guess. All right, this is what they said. We, got, we became aware of you because of, of New York Magazine. Uh, they did a story a couple of weeks ago in which uh, it's called, he's got, the wor he's got the world on a string. String theory is the hottest development in physics since Stephen Hawking first peered into a, a black hole. And Columbia physicist Brian Greene is one of the few people who can explain it. <laughs> he also acts in Pinter plays and packs lecture halls. And his new book, The Elegant Universe, is getting rapturous advanced reviews. Has the theory of everything finally found the spokesman it deserves? I mean, is that where you might be about being the spokesman for the theory that will explain everything? Yeah, I don't really see it that way. I mean, I, I really wanted to write this book because I, I see modern physics as following a 2,000-year-long quest to understand how the universe works. And it's become so technical that people who aren't trained can't really follow the developments. And I think it's something that should be shared. It should be out there. These are incredibly exciting ideas, and anybody who wants to know about them should be able. But I, I'm a physicist at heart, and doing the research is really the thing that I'm about. Well, here's what else they say about you in New York Magazine. He's a great communicator. He's charismatic. He's clearly top of the heat intellectually. So the fact that he has gobs of raw physical appeal on top of that, it gives him a really serious mystique. How did you come to uh, wanting to be involved in the answer to one of the fundamental questions of the universe? Yeah, that, that question I, I, I've thought about now and then, and I think it really goes back and I think they even mentioned in the article, when I was, I don't know, 13 or 14, having those existential crises that adolescents do, you know, what's it all about, why <laughs> yeah, are right. we here? Right. And, and it just occurred to me that so many people, much smarter than I, had thought about these questions through the ages and hadn't come up with very much. Yeah. So it was unlikely that I was going to contribute anything to the answers, but I figured maybe I can just understand the questions at a real deep level, and that will be the closest that I can come to try to be comfortable with it. What string theory is. Sure. The basic idea is string theory is incredibly interesting. Your guys have thoughts below. This was talked about 24 years ago. I wonder what he's up to now or where he's at. Anyone know of people like Michio Kaku that can explain string theory like he does? For people like me, and I'm not a genius. Well, I am Michio Kaku, and I'd be glad to answer that question. First of all, most textbooks say that an electron is a dot. Particles that we see in our atom smashers are dots. But if I had a super microscope, I could see that that dot is actually a rubber band. From a distance, this rubber band looks like a dot. Close up, you see that it's a vibrating string. Now, this rubber band can vibrate in many different modes. You know, when he's saying a vibrating string, that r reminds me of frequency. So if you tie with frequency, frequency ties with sound. So it's literally the manifestation of sound through vibrations and frequencies. Kind of like if you look back in the Bible with Genesis, how was everything created? He spoke it into existence. So just something to think about when correlating string theory into your life journey. Modes. Each mode can be called a particle. So for example, this might be an electron. But if you twirl it in a different way, it becomes a quark. And if you twirl it this way, you have to give it a different name. We call it a neutrino. Now how many ways can one string vibrate? The answer is obvious, an infinite number of vibrations on the same string. And so we think that all the subatomic particles of the universe, the quarks, the neutrinos, the mesons, the protons, the neutrons, there's a galaxy of these particles. They're nothing but musical notes on a tiny rubber band, a rubber band so small that it looks like a dot. So what is physics that we had to struggle with in high school? Physics is the harmonies the harmonies of vibrating strings. Physics tells us how these vibrations move. What is chemistry? 
Chemistry is when these strings bump into each other and form molecules. These are pictures of equations. I've been, for the last 15 years, trying to answer the kinds of questions that my colleagues here have been raising. And what I've come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that contain all the information of a set of equations that are related to string theory. And it's even more bizarre than that because when you then try to understand these pictures, you find out that buried in them are computer codes just like the type that you find in a browser when you go surf the web. And so I'm left with the puzzle of trying to figure out whether I live in the matrix or not. Leading a group of both mathematicians and physicists about uh, 10 years ago, we found an extraordinary result in some of the equations that are part of string theory. We have discovered that there are mathematical structures that are indistinguishable from error correcting codes. Many people like to say my work supports simulation theory. I actually believe that it's pointing to something far more beautiful and subtle about the nature of the laws of physics. Man, my brother on to something, man. What's he talking about, y'all? Yeah? Has my brother figured out the code with zeros and ones? Has he finally connected the dots to quantum mechanics in reality? Let's dive deeper. If you haven't hit that like and subscribe button, if you like diving into these quantum waters, then let's go. The more we study it, the more we realize that its properties are mathematical. Leading a group of both mathematicians and physicists about uh, 10 years ago, we found an extraordinary result. In the more we study it, the more we realize that its properties are mathematical. Leading a group of both mathematicians and physicists about uh, 10 years ago, we found an extraordinary result in some of the equations that are part of string theory. We have discovered that there are mathematical structures that are indistinguishable from error correcting codes as does occur in digital information transmission. We have strong suspicions that the next step in physics has got to pull the rug out from under us. So the slogan is that because of gravity and quantum mechanics, the notion of space time is doomed. These are just places where our theories simply break down. So we were led to ask this question then, is there some deeper structure underlying space time and quantum mechanics? And if so, it's clear that it must involve new physical and mathematical ideas. And so you start to wonder what sort of new world of ideas do these objects come from? The rules of space time and quantum mechanics arise as derivative notions from this more abstract mathematical structure. More proof of God through math and science. This is a direct follow-up to the video I just did, Mathematical Proof of God. I'm going to offer you two points today, one from math, one from science, then a quick point. The first being the Fibonacci sequence. You know, this golden ratio, the spiral you see right now behind my head. This spiral pattern is seen all throughout creation from the human body to galaxies itself, waves, sunflowers, snowflakes. It just keeps going on forever. Now, why would a man-made concept be obeyed by nature and creation itself? This is proof of a signature of a creator, this Fibonacci sequence. Now, I want you to tie this in with fractal geometry and the thought of the Mandelbrot sequence and the accompanying Julia. Now, this thing goes on forever. This is also called God's thumbprint for a reason. Just like every thumbprint is unique, it all looks the same. And the Mandelbrot, you literally can zoom in infinitely forever, which is a representation of the infinite God. Let's shift from fractal geometry and move to particle physics. What did Dr. James Gates have to say at the Dr. Isaac Asimov debate and conference? Well, basically, he's discovered this code in which we are totally simulated in. He's discovered that we were totally created, and he can prove it through science. Just go ahead and look that up. Moving away from quarks and subatomic entanglement, I'll leave you with one final thought, also in the DNA, which also is in the Fibonacci sequence. Behind me, Greg Braden made a discovery when he applied the periodic table to an ancient text, the Sefer Yetzirah. When he applied the instructions exactly, the first strand of DNA, aside from the peptide sequence, which I covered, says God eternal within the body. Beginning of the 20th century, many physicists believed the completion of physics was near. Only a few minor issues needed to be sorted out, and all of physics would be known. The Newtonian deterministic universe would finally be understood. But this was radically changed when the subatomic world was studied in depth. Max Planck calculated that electrons could only radiate in chunks of energy, or in quanta, 
instead of gradually losing energy over time. Each quantum or chunk would suddenly radiate from the electrons, seemingly without cause or an impressed force. The discovery of these quantum leaps began the beginning of the strange study of quantum mechanics. intensity in the middle, and when several waves go through a double slit, they interfere with each other, creating an interference pattern. So shooting particles through a double slit should reveal they interfere with each other, creating an interference pattern. So shooting particles through a double slit should reveal if they act like waves or particles. In various double slit experiments, particles were fired through a single slit, and the results revealed that particles were acting like waves. The particles go through both slits, and the wave-like properties interfere with each other, causing an interference pattern. However, something strange happened when we tried to shoot one particle at a time. This way, multiple particles with wave-like properties cannot interfere with each other. Even so, when one particle was fired at a time, we still observed an interference pattern. The interesting thing that is happening is each particle is arriving at a specific spot on the back screen, meaning they seem to be acting like little bits of matter, not as waves of energy. However, after several particles are fired individually, an interference pattern starts to emerge. But how could that be? we saw with the formulation of the Schrodinger equation. To better explain this in the quantum enigma, Bruce Rosenblum and Fred Kuttner explain with a simple scenario representing what is actually happening. If we were to take an electron 
and isolate it in a superposition of two boxes and open one box, the electron would collapse in either one or the other. So if you don't see it in one, it will definitely exist in the other. However, if you were to take another pair of boxes and open them both simultaneously, the radical implication cannot just be ignored by saying it stopped with the first interaction. The same quantum rules apply to the particles that make up the measuring apparatus. So you need something else to collapse the particles for that apparatus, and so on and so on. The chain keeps going back until you get to something that is not bound by the same rules. And as physicist John von Neumann identified, the only logical place to stop this chain is with the one who is ultimately performing the measurement, the conscious observer. These implications show consciousness is not a product of physical interactions in the brain, because if it was, it would also need to be collapsed as well. But the evidence implies the need for something, not bound by the same laws of quantum mechanics, which can cause the ultimate collapse for all of matter. Otherwise, there is no logical explanation for what causes collapse in the existence of matter. So if experiments show an observer is needed to cause collapse and all of matter is bound by these same rules, then the most logical inference is consciousness is ultimately and philosophically the cause of the collapse of the wave function and the physical existence of matter itself. Quantum mechanics, the very fundamental nature of reality, leads us to the idea of consciousness is not physical and is more real than matter itself. The evidence infers there is no escape. We have to face the reality that the physical makeup of space-time is dependent on conscious observers. As Eugene Wigner said, the laws of quantum mechanics cannot be formulated without recourse to the concept of consciousness. Henry Stapp says, The laws of quantum mechanics itself cannot be formulated without recourse to the concept of consciousness. Ooh, we got y'all in the headlock with that one. The solution hinges not on quantum randomness, but rather on the dynamical effects within quantum theory of the intention and attention of the observer. Stephen Barr says, human beings are observers and perhaps the only observers. This fact clearly has potentially huge implications for the question of whether the human mind is entirely reducible to physics and mathematics. The very fundamental nature of matter implies consciousness is not a product of it, but that the opposite is true. Physical matter is a product of consciousness thus leading to an idealistic or dualistic approach to reality. The physical universe is a product of mind and the very fundamental pieces of reality require an observer. The old view of materialism is inadequate in fitting the data. There are simply no hidden variables and no interpretation of quantum mechanics that cannot account for the data without being ad hoc. Reality is dependent on conscious observers. As Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner said, while a number of philosophical ideas may be logically consistent with present quantum mechanics, materialism is not. Your thoughts below, chat. Let's keep it rolling. Three glass beakers. Dr. Emoto has conducted another interesting... Dr. Emoto has conducted another interesting experiment. He placed rice into three glass beakers and covered it with water. And then every day for a month, he said, thank you to one beaker. You're an idiot to the second. And the third one, he completely ignored. After one month, the rice that had been thanked began to ferment giving off a strong, pleasant aroma. The rice in the second beaker turned black. And the rice that was ignored began to rot. Dr. Emoto has conducted... Interesting. This is a specific type of photography that captures light energy. I can't reference the type of photography, but you can find it in the comment section below. I really want to explain more about the light body because people can't wrap their head around that you're not supposed to eat meat. You're only to eat food that of which comes from seeds. 
The only way a seed can grow, it literally has to absorb the sun. The body cannot live without the soul, and the light body transports the soul. Now let me just be unequivocally clear here, the body is electrical. The body needs around 6,500 angstroms of energy to thrive on a daily basis. Now you can get that from fruit, vegetables, going out in the sun, grounding. Vegetables yield around 9,000 angstroms of energy while fruit does around 12,000 angstroms of energy. Now the system has you brainwashed to think that you need vitamins, a low calorie diet that's filled with high protein. The body does not need vitamins. The body needs minerals. And what people don't seem to realize is the synthetic vitamins that are on the shelves literally bind to light metals in the body, stripping you of them. Not to mention, water is so smart of an organism, it will seek minerals in the body and bind to them if you are not drinking water that has minerals. If you're not drinking natural spring water, the water will bind to minerals and strip you of them as well. Every single ailment can also be traced back to a mineral deficiency. Living 150 years to me is short, but for other people it seems impossible to think they could even live to the age of 100 because you've been brainwashed. You've been given concepts on nutrition, concepts on living. The system has given you a fictitious scale to dwarf your potential as well as externalize all of your power. When you're sitting here and telling me that I need protein to gain muscle, this is a simple transformation done in 5 months. With absolutely zero protein supplementation, fasting, eating raw fruit, and taking minerals. The only reason why you thrive on a meat carnivore diet is not because the meat is healthy for you, but it's because you're cutting out the sugars, the gluten, and the other starches that are the glue that holds the toxemia in your body. But also meat is loaded with minerals and B12. However, there's a very nasty trade-off when eating meat. It creates a very acidic environment and shuts down enzymes that break down bacteria in the body causes inflammation on the mucous membrane and it allows bacteria to thrive. Then we have nutrition specialists saying that the alkaline diet is is your stomach acid level, but that's not how this works. There's a reason why people get acid reflex because the body's too acidic in the consumption of meat. When you eat and drink things that are naturally alkaline, the enzymes that break down bacteria in the body will thrive, eradicating any illness or ailment known to man. Dr. Sebi proved this and for the exact reason why I haven't been sick in years. Look, you can believe what you want, eat whatever you want. I just want to give you an alternative just in case it's the fan. And if you want more descriptive information on fasting or eating alkaline, I go over this information for free in my web course. I know I'm not supposed to eat meat, y'all. I'm trying to get better, but I love them nachos. I love pepperoni pizza. I know y'all, I hear y'all now, no, vegetables, even, you're right, you are right, okay, I love it, I love pepperoni pizza, I love nachos with hamburgers and cheese, with sauce on top, that is me, I love it, but I know, trust me, the garden, I know, vegetable seeds, I know, and if you are listening to this, just know that vegetables and plants are so important, if you can at least just get a smoothie, you know, if you guys watch my lives, I tell you guys, I want at least three smoothies a week from you, go get some vegetables, some frozen vegetables, and some orange juice. That's it. Blend it up. Throw a banana in there. Fresh banana. The rest is frozen. Orange juice or apple juice tastes great, you know? But blend it up together and give me at least three shakes a week. Shout out to everyone that's been drinking their shakes like I've been telling you. Please, y'all watch my videos. I need y'all. Drink them shakes. I need one myself. After I get done making this video, I'm probably going to go in there and make one. But let's dive even deeper, y'all. Every religion has a sacred river. For the Egyptians, it's the River Nile. For Christianity, it's the Jordan River. This river is actually the canal which goes from the bottom of your spine. To you can heal from anything in 90 to 180 days. All you got to do is fast, which is basically cleanse yourself. You allow your body to do what it's naturally made to do. 
which is heal itself. Because the last time you cut yourself, you didn't have to do anything. Your body showed you it knows how to heal. Your body is not a one-way street. The only reason why your body is acting up is because you're mistreating your body. And whatever disease or illness that you got, that's your body showing you that you've been mistreating it. And that you need to start treating your body the way you should treat it. By feeding it the stuff that is made for it that won't harm it. Because if you eat something that makes you sick, it's not your food. If you eat something that gives you the itis, that is not your food. If you eat something that makes you constipated, that is not your food. If you eat something that your body don't recognize and don't know how to process, that is not your food. And your body is letting you know. Because you get your GERDs, you get your gout, you get your, you get your boils under your armpits, you get your psoriasis, you get your acne. That's your body letting you know, bro, you done put something inside of me that I don't recognize, so I don't know how to process. So the natural process of me taking, you know, of me taking the vitamins, the minerals, the fructose, and then I poop everything else that I don't need, I'm not doing that. So now it's stuff being stuck inside of me, and now it's rotting, and it's causing me to go through all this stuff like the cancers and the tumors and it's clogging up your arteries and your blood vessels because that's not your food when you put it in me i don't recognize it as food so i do not put in the work to break it down i'm here to break down stuff that is naturally made for me so if you put something inside of me that there's a great chance i might not process it and it's gonna be stuck inside of me and then after it gets stuck inside of me for a long time you're gonna start seeing the effects of it whether it's the right It's PCOS, whatever you're dealing with. And yes, I said it. I know a lot of y'all is shocked. Herpes. Something that you can catch with the stuff that you eat, like chicken and turkey. It's nothing but worms, you know. Vile the food you eat. So if you want to heal yourself from anything, get out of your body's way and allow yourself to heal. Because when you stop eating, your, the, all the cells in your body, they start to chew away at all the negative cells. They start to eat away at the tumor. Your body start to remove the body. The same thing that you do every night when you go to sleep. Your body is fasting. That's why you wake up. Your tongue white, white stuff on the side of your eyes, white stuff on the side of your mouth. That's your body showing you it's removing both. And if you want your body to continue to remove, you have to stop eating and begin fasting. And when you fasting and you start, you know, juicing and you start taking an herb, that is a battery for your body to speed up the process of what it's naturally made to do, which is heal itself. And if you want to heal yourself, you know, you don't need no insurance. You don't need no thousands of dollars. All you're going to need is the same money you was investing into the foods and the drinks that made you sick. You invest it into a juicer and the fruits and the herbs that's going to heal you from whatever you have. And after you heal, don't go back to eating the You're just going to end up in worse situations than you was before. I have to cleanse your lymphatic system because that is your sewage system. The same way I'm eating right now, when I eat, when that food goes in my body, the cells in my body, they eat also. The same way I eat and I poop, my cells eat and they poop also. And your lymphatic system is your sewage system. So if you eat and your cells eat and then your cells poop and your body is not clean enough for the shit that they poop to get up out of there, you're going to end up with... You know, this is for... It. You know, this is for entertainment purposes. Always consult a professional and do your research on everything, you know. But that reminds me about that Bible scripture. Um, I forgot what chapter it was in or what book it was exactly. Maybe you guys can refresh my memory. But, you know, there was this kid thrashing about and the prophets. They tried to take the demon out of this boy that was thrashing about, but they couldn't do it. So Jesus um, came on the scene and he said, "Wop!" got the demon right up out of him. You know, the uh, prophets, they look at him like, how did you do that? He said, with this type of demon, you have to do prayer and fasting alone to get rid of him. So, yeah, fasting and a little prayer wouldn't hurt as well. You know, but uh, yeah, do your own research on everything. And uh, we do this for um, entertainment purposes. But let's keep it rolling. My food contains glucose. 
The fuel that feeds the trillions of healthy cells in my body. But that glucose also feeds something else. Zombie cells. Old, damaged cells that have lingered beyond their useful life. By spewing toxic sludge, these zombies infect other healthy cells, speeding up the aging process. Everything from hair loss and wrinkles to the onset of arthritis, cancer and dementia. But what scientists have realized is that when we fast and cut off the supply of glucose, that zombie army is starved of energy, which saps them of their power. When food is plentiful, our body stores excess energy in the form of fat, under the skin and around the internal organs. When food is scarce, that fat is sent to the liver, where it's turned into an alternative fuel source called a ketone. And it's these ketones which provide the emergency power source, not only for our bodies, but also our brains. Remember those toxic zombie cells aging my body? Well, they're not the only things getting dealt with. Even inside my healthy cells, there's wear and tear. But scientists think that without food to process, those cells can switch into repair mode. Fixing damage, cleaning up garbage, nipping any problems in the bud. With the zombies in check and the rest of me in tip-top condition, the future looks healthier and also longer. My food contains... It's always good to see a, you know, a 3D in depth view like that. You know, those are always very informative. You know, man, I need to eat healthy, man. Watch me eat nachos after watching all these healthy videos, man. I ain't right, man. Okay. Let's keep it going, y'all. Fasting, you don't lose weight, you lose impurities. Everybody that hear us talking now, tonight when they go to sleep, will go on a fast. Once you go to sleep, the body goes on a fast. When you wake up, meet your first meal, we call it breakfast. It's breaking the fast. You can't tell people that they should just start fasting. Well, you know what? When you tell people that, you say, why don't you go home and fast? And they'll go home and say, I heard Dick Gregory, I want to fast. They say, well, did you check with a doctor? You don't check with a doctor. And all the things that I ever did to corrupt my body, I never checked with nobody. Someone asked me the other day, some news uh, station said, you know, you've been fasting for 30 some years. What does your doctor think? My doctor 27 years. <laughs> fasting, you don't lose weight, you lose impurities. Everybody. It's so refreshing seeing old school, you know, talk wisdom to the youth, man. It's so refreshing. If you're an older generation watching this video, you know, we need y'all, man. We need y'all to make more videos. We need y'all more than ever. But um, that's it for today's video. If y'all appreciate this, drop a like. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you're on the fence about it, go ahead and hit that button anyway, because we'll love to have you. And if you made it this far, drop the 100s in the comments so I know you're real. Nah, y'all real anyway, but the hundreds do help, you know, it helps get these videos out here and it helps me, you know, get in touch with my fan base. When you guys comment, you know, I try to comment back, you know, I know who my regulars are already. People that I know that jump in the comments, you know, I can automatically expect them. Shout out to the people in the UK, you know, shout out to my people in Texas. You know, we got people all over the world, you know, this is a global wake up and I just, you know. I want to thank all you guys, you know, from uh, I just want to thank everyone for watching these videos. And I appreciate you guys from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. And um, I'll see you guys on tomorrow's episode. As always, peace. Make sure y'all get that shaking, y'all, man. That smoothie, I mean, you know, frozen vegetables.
um, go to the store, frozen vegetables. You can get apple juice or orange juice and uh, drop a banana in that boy. You know, blend it up, get it nice and cold. Bap, bap. You know, it's good once your forehead starts sweating and your, you know, you just sitting there just drinking this and your body sweating, you know, then you know it's good, you know, but y'all be good, man. I'll see y'all on the next one. It's your boy Jesky Chuck with another creepy and scary TikTok that might just change your reality. We out. <laughs> Peace.